initially Shell was was going to cover this chapter also on the next one because he was very interested in learning these basic aspects of front end. Uh, but I, I know it seems that she has an issue, something about the holidays, so she can make it. So I I prepared like only a couple hours ago some notes uh, for the chapter. I, I didn't finish the last section about booster. Uh, but I did complete the exercises, uh, and I think uh, maybe that's where we find more interesting stuff, because I think you already know some of the uh, HTML basics in the part as well. Yeah, that's, I think, basics, yeah. Okay. So let me begin. Okay, so for this chapter, this chapter five of the book, uh, JavaScript for Data Science, we will be going to cover a basic understanding of what makes a web page. And for this section, that will consist of uh, learning the basics of HTML, that is how do you define the structure of a page, and CSS, so how do you style such web page. Uh, well, for the first part about creating HTML elements, well, they follow a similar syntax. Uh, we use this notation uh, for the tag name. Inside, inside this, you define the content for your, for your element. And in general, uh, given this opening tag, you also have this closing tag over here. Well, the difference is it's trailing a slash. Uh, however, there are some elements, uh, they are called void elements because they can't have children, uh, for which the syntax is a little bit different. So you have, again, your opening tag. However, there is no ending tag. So you only have this, your trailing slash in order to avoid some possible errors so that the browser actually uh, understand, understands which type of HTML element you're trying to create. Well, and over here, there are some attributes, some properties related to this specific element uh, that in the following sections, we explore a little bit, which of those can we use? <laughs> uh, but an important part is that the elements of a web page, they form what is called a, a tree structure. Uh, well, the name tree is because it is really a mathematical structure. It's a type of, of graph. And over here, there is a link to it. Uh, in general, Wikipedia is bad for for refer references, but I know uh, as a mathematician, as a mathematician, I think it's very good at this for mathematics. I I don't know for other fields if if it is so respectable. Um, but basically, what this means, this tree structure, is that the elements, the HTML elements, have to be strictly nested. Um, how do we recognize that in the HTML code is basically this. So if we have some element X, as you can see over here, and it has some children, in, in this case it's element Y, well, the end of its child, in this case Y, has to be also inside the, the parent element. So descending of Y, descending tag, has to be inside of this section. So this would be not valid because the ending of the child, well, sorry, the ending tag, sorry, the closing tag of the child is outside of the of the of its parent, in this case, the X element. Now, for a particular example, it's basically this, what they mean by the tree structure. Uh, in this case, we have some HTML element that is, a, a, how do you say? Uh, uh, that is called the root element. Uh, that is a global container in a sense. So we have our head, and inside this we have, for example, a title element, some content Google, and also a, a style tag. Where well, later on we can define some CSS code in such in such a space. Uh, but uh, uh, sorry, and um, but you, you also have as a child of the HTML element, as you can see over here is the body. And um, we can already see from the picture in the right 
that we have already this kind of family tree structure. So HTML is uh, the ancestor, its children are head and body. For head, its children are title and style, as we can see. Uh, and each of these types has some content. And well, lastly, for body, it also has some children on their, of their own. In this case, are the deep tag, the center tag, that I believe it's already been deprecated. And again, some generic div tag. And we can see it's also considered this tree over here as a children of body. And, and this terminology of child parent, uh, I mean, that's uh, the common terms that one finds whenever you're uh, looking for a front end material. Uh, they usually uh, produce some very weird like Google searches because I mean, sometimes one has to, to look for something like how to remove children from parents. And you want to do that in a front end way. So that is like, how do we eliminate, for example, these three elements from this specific parent element, the body. Uh, but, but you have to make sure to, to add in some front end terminology in order to not get blacklisted. So, uh, as you can see, there is a basic structure for defining elements. However, we saw these special terms, this one over here, this character. Uh, and this one over here, they already have a predetermined use. They are the opening, sorry, they are part of the opening and closing tag. So if you want to include this character, not, not as, a, as a usual syntax for creating an element, but just including such character, uh, there's going to be an issue with, with how the browser recognizes such character because it has a special definition and, and special significance. So in order for the browser to recognize the character as such, uh, well, we can use what is called the escape sequence. And it's basically a special syntax for the special characters as well. In this case, if you want to write this character, well, you type in this, a number sign followed by, uh, well, a, a, a short text description of the character. In this case, it's less than. And then it ends with a semicolon. So these are, these are some basic examples. And for the pages, and let's see, the general structure of a page is usually, uh, as we saw in the example above, uh, a root element, that is a HTML element, and its job is its job is that it's a global enclosure, so it encloses everything else, every part of the of the web page. Sorry, every sorry, every element in the web in the web page is a children. Sorry, a, a descendant of this element. And then we have a head element. And in the book, they mentioned that it is basically for <coughs> defining some properties of the page, but Perhaps we can be a little bit more precise um, because this element is used for specifying metadata. So again, as the book says, some, some information about the page, something like perhaps the title or who is the author. That is what you usually define if you're working with R Markdown, what you define in the YAML. And again, in this part, uh, in, this, in this head element, we usually also include the dependencies. So as we are going, as we were going to see in, in the following example, we usually include uh, which CSS files are we using for this project, and also which JavaScript files are we using. And lastly, uh, we have also a single body element, and um, what it is going to be contained in this element uh, will be the content that will be displayed in the page. What it is over here. Uh, we don't really take a look at that. It's just information for for the browser, for in order to in order for the page to work properly. What we see uh, in our navigator, in, 
for example, in chrome or image, is what is inside this body element. And let's also comment about the indentation. I think for, for HTML, the usual is to use, well, two tabs or four spaces, uh, but really it doesn't matter. Uh, it still gets recognized. And over here is just a simple description of what is a basic structure of an HTML page. So as an example, we'll, we can create one now. So I'm going to copy paste this code. And let me, okay, copy paste it over here. There should be an index. I don't know, I'll mark down eight my file again. So let me create it one more time. Okay, so I will create an index.html file. That is usually a name that you define for you for what is going to be your main page. So the browser recognizes that index HTML uh, as a main page. And in this case, I will simply copy paste the code that I had for this example. And if we can see, now for let's see, I will take a look at this app. So let me open it. Okay. First, what is this title tag doing? Well, it defines, as you can see in this text, the text to be displayed in this browser tab. For example, it says this text is displayed, is displayed in the browser bar, precisely as we defined. Um, well, for the body, we define some level one header. So that's basically like the main title and then some paragraph. Perhaps the important, no, not important, but new uh, sort of HTML element that we have encountered over here is this one, EM. As you can see for JavaScript, the text has been uh, italicized. Um, there is a mention on the book that if you want to make your text italic, well, you can use em or you can use the i tag. As we can see, no, wait, I think it's going to end. Oh, no, I didn't end. Okay, good. As you can see, it is still italicized. Or you can use perhaps it's the strong tag in order to, to, to make it bold or the big tag. And it produces the same visual output. And the difference between using B or strong for bolded text or I or EM for italic, well, it's in this part over here. And in this link. Let me open it. Okay. And and the main, uh, well, you, well, then you can read it. Uh, I have to push the changes. But the main idea is that if we use EM and strong instead of the other one, I and B, well, then the screen reader, that is this, uh, this assistive uh, technolo technology for people who, well, they can see. So they, they need something in order for them to, to read the content of the website. If they use such type of technology, when such tool is recognizing the EM and the strong text, well, then the voice of the, of, of the, well, of the sound produced by such tool is also going to change. In this case, it's going to emphasize for EM and for a strong, I think the volume changes. Over here, it's over here. However, if you use these other tags, I and B, then the screen reader, its tone will remain the same. So the person who needed such technology because they couldn't read on their own. And I mean, for them, for they, for them, there is not going to be a difference. So it's, it, for that reason, it's preferred to use this one. It, it makes for a more inclusive um, website. And this there, and this uh, concept of inclusivity is actually very, I don't know if popular, but it, it comes up a lot when you're learning front end uh, because there are a lot of good 
and bad practices uh, with how you should define your code so that people that are using these screen readers uh, so that they can also get a good experience from the site. Uh, it, and it doesn't come down just to which text to use, but also which attributes to define for your elements. And such part about attributes is what comes next. And they are basically a way to customize your elements. Uh, well, they follow this type of syntax, some name, and then you assign some value and you put it in brackets. Uh, sometimes it's not necessary. And over here I included some examples. If we had written this code for the page, then what we are defining via this title attribute is what text do we want to be displayed when this specific item is hovered. In this case, as I hover in this item, and we get such a specific string. Uh, you can also define a class for an element, uh, and that is going to be useful when we use CSS. Basically, you are assigning a specific set of styles that you want, well, that you have defined and that you want to apply for this element in particular. Uh, and lastly, there is one that it, there is one attribute that, well, it's more generic because it's called a data attribute. Uh, for this specific sample, uh, oh no, wait, I forgot to open it in another. For this specific example, I included in the Mozilla page that describes it. Um, basically, what it does is that if you want to con if you want to include some information about your element, but that information may be quite generic, so there is not a specific attribute that you can use in order to encode such information. Well, then you can use this syntax. You write data, uh, well, line, and then some string. In this case, I named it anything. And over here, the value of this attribute is it can be any any information that you want to encode about this specific element. And then there are ways to retrieve this specific information that you have uh, defined. So it's a more generic attribute. <laughs> it's used a lot, actually. Um, and, and one specific rule is that if you define an attribute for uh, for one element, then it should only appear once in, well, in the opening tab. So in this case, I have already defined a title, so I shouldn't define, define another title over here as well. Only one for opening tab. Well, the part about list, well, they can be order or unordered. In this part, I, I want to look at the, at the book so that we can see how, how does this, no, uh, how does this HTML code gets interpreted by the browser? So if we want to create an, an order list, we use a UL tag and inside, so that would be the item for the list. Uh, we define them via the li tag, the list item tag. So basically, the browser interprets this as this type of list. For an order list, we simply change the parent tag. In this case, it's OL because order list. And the outcome, the outcome is this one over here. And lastly, you can also uh, nest your list. And you do that via including the nested list inside one of the LI sorry, inside one of the items of your initial list. So we can see from this, uh, the outcome is this one over here. For tables, uh, I found it, uh, well, I found it uh, like a little discrepancy between the structure defined by the book for a table, they present this one, and, and the usual that at least I have encountered when learning uh, front end, just from a pure front end perspective, not, not related to data science. And uh, because an example of the book, if we can see, well, let me, okay. Oh. Okay. So 
You also use your table element, and then you use a TR element that is a table row. Obviously, to define a row. Uh, but for the content in the cell of your table, you use a ED tag, that is a table data. But the difference between this type of structure uh, and at least the common one that I have encountered in other front end, in other front end studies is the use of the table head and the table body tags. In this case, there is no head. Well, table head, they just are using this one. Uh, but really, this could have been this could have been a table da data tag, and the output would be the same. Really, uh, in the more general setting uh, that I have encountered, this one, this one over here. So you define also the header for your tables via the, the T head. Sorry, the head of your table via this tag, and it's in this part where you use that T TH tag. No, not in a generic uh, TR tag as they are doing in the book. And now for the content of the cells, um, not for the head, but for the body of the table, then you also have this T body tag. Um, over here is really similar to the code that we have seen in the book. But really, we can do this type of uh, terminology for our table. It even uh, assume th that this line is not present and, and it still works. I, I have I have also seen uh, some cases where you just use table row and table data. So no header, no sorry, no head, no body. Just this one over here. So it's okay as well. Uh, now for this part about links, well I, I feel that the book I don't want to say that they did a poor job with this part, but uh, like links, uh, I mean, they, they're pretty well powered in, in HTML. Like they can do a lot of things uh, and, and they don't show any of them over here. And they basically <laughs> provide this, uh, well, basic description. And that is that if you want to link from one page to another, well, you can use a link. And the way to do that in HTML is via an anchor tag. And we create that via this uh, text. So as we can see, this is an anchor tag. Um, this value of the attribute href is going to be where do we want to go. It can be an URL, as we can see over here, or it can be um, a local path, as we can see in this case. It takes you to the main page, well, or home page. But what I wanted to add in that section is that, well, you can do a lot more stuff with links. Uh, but before that, uh, that is over here. I want to mention this part about if there are links, where are they called anchors? Uh, I, I find these two answers like good enough in order to explain that's why that's the, why that's the case. But the main idea is that uh, well, the creator of HTML, uh, he based the anchor tag in something that already existed before. And it was that uh, for PDFs, you had this uh, type of functionality that you can click into a section of the text and it takes you inside the same document to another region. And that's basically what we do with a table of contents, right? For example, we click some chapter and it takes us directly to such a specific chapter when we are looking at a table of contents. Uh, and that's the, the basic or, or the main functionality of an anchor, at least in the PDF context where, where it seems to have a rise. And, and well, and the term anchor is because it's supposed to like represent what the anchor does to a, a boat. So it's like drawing you, dragging you from one place to the other. Uh, but it's an it's a name anchor that prevailed, but really in the case of HTML, uh, we are not we are no longer limited to take us from one point of the document to another point of the same document. We can go we can go to other a uh, page, to other document. And in, an interesting 
the mechanic is this one this one's over here so let me uh, share with you some cool properties about anchors well anchors in html let's see in these examples well some basic ones are that uh, over here over here well you can also link to an email address as we can see the terminology changes a little bit you can also link to a telephone number but perhaps a, a cooler one is this one over here that say you have a canvas a canvas is a special type of html element that allows you to draw so think of it like a, a whiteboard and what you can do with an anchor tag it's also define some uh, value that you want to, do, to download in this case we are downloading some image and we're going to be generating an image using a canvas so like draw something in the page and then download such drawing as a png file and you can see that uh, maybe i should share it sorry, in the in the chat okay and you can see the code uh, that creates that it's over here so you define your sorry you select the canvas element you perform some drawing and then uh, the cool part is over here that you can uh, well sorry for the whiteboard each element that you have created well you can convert such information into a url you were we are performing such action over here and then using the the property that we have defined over here if we click uh, in this in this anchor uh, it's going to download uh, such a specific drawing that we have that we have uh, well drawn. It's mainly this part about uh, encoding something as a as a URL or another thing that it is called. I think it's called a blog. I don't think it's explained here. I know it, it is. So basically, there are some mechanics for JavaScript so that you can create files for the user to download. It doesn't have to be an image, perhaps a JSON file and such. Uh, and a cool, sorry, uh, well, it's also cool, but a common occurrence is that if you want the user to download something, well, you create such a thing, you convert it into some, into, into some type of URL, and then you create an anchor. You, to that anchor, you define this down, what is it? Uh, it was a download attribute, uh, it's over here. You define the download attribute for the name that you want the, the file to have. And, and then you make it so that once this anchor is clicked, then the file gets downloaded. And, and it's in a similar fashion as over here, basically encoding the information via some URL. So uh, really they're quite powerful. They are no longer anchors in the PDF. And they both way. Cool. That was kind of new to me. Okay, great. So now for images. Well, I wanted to show you an example of, of what they mean in this part. About again, there is this recurrence of encoding as a string. In this case, you can uh, encode an image as text. And this usually shows via pa a pattern like this, data, something like this, I think. And then like a humongous string, like sometimes you see in some web pages. Uh, but I, I didn't find one in particular. I know that you can create one. For example, if you're working with some R Markdown file and you use a self-contained property, I think it was something like self-contained. You set it to true. Then once you open the HTML file generated, in that part, they, well, you can find that the images have been encoded as text. So when you try to, to look at the HTML code for the page, sometimes it's quite laggy because there are some humongous strings in your file, in your index, 
buffer in your HTML file that has been created that they are basically decent codes. Uh, another type of storing an image into an HTML page is via using SVGs. Uh, this was, we are going to see that in the chapter of visualizing data. I, I was going to cover it, but uh, I, I don't think I, I want to anymore. I, I wanted to do it because I wanted to show the, that some of the capabilities of the plots model from the from observable. Uh, but I'm not sure anymore. Maybe we can explore D3 instead. Because it's a, it's a little bit more powerful. Actually plots, well, actually that plots module is, it's, uh, has been constructed on top of the D3 library. Uh, maybe I will share the link. Uh, well, basically this is uh, probably the most complete library for visualization. I think it has a, a, an HTML widget for R, but, but again, uh, usually our HTML widgets are also quite limited into how many of the properties of the of the library that you have wrapped, the JavaScript library, how many of those properties can you access? But I, I hope to show you all a little bit of the tree in, in that chapter. Okay, but that, that was a part about storing images inside HTML pages. Uh, but another, uh, perhaps the more common way that we see in the internet is to store your images elsewhere and then simply reference to them in your page. And that is basically what we are doing with the image tag. And in, order, in order to reference such a specific location of the image, well, you use the source attribute. So it works kind of like href as we saw for the anchors. Uh, we can provide a local, uh, an, an absolute path, or we can also provide a, a URL for where to look for the image. Uh, however, sometimes the image does not exist. Maybe at some point in your project, it got erased and one didn't notice. So it's also usual to use, uh, sorry, to, to define this alt attribute. And that is going to be the alternative text that is going to be displayed uh, in, the, in the region of your image. In, in the case that the image was not found, so it was never loaded. Uh, this one is also very useful for uh, for a screen reader. So again, we come back to this uh, concept of uh, what was the name? Accessible. Was, what? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, I don't know if it was inclusivity. There was a special name in front of for that. So for this next part, we have already explored the basic structure of a web page. So what we are going to see now is how do we actually style it? Because for this uh, particular example that we saw, this basic web page, uh, well, it looks pretty horrible in the sense that it is too basic, at least for modern standards. If one comes back to, I don't know, to pages from the nineties and such, uh, they really aren't that different from what we are showing over here. It's like mainly a couple colors have been applied and such. So in, in this part about cascading style sheets, also referred as CSS, we're going to see how to declare the style for our particular website. And also note that CSS is not a programming language. It's also not a markup language. Uh, really, it's what is called a style sheet language. But what you care about such definition is just that what it is doing is simply defining the presentation for another markup language. In this case, uh, for HTML. Uh, however, that doesn't mean the CSS is easy. Uh, it can get quite complex. In this case, uh, I linked to some particular projects where they create games 
but only using some basic HTML and a lot of CSS. Uh, I like this one over here. And of course, we can see the code. The, the HTML is pretty basic, some header and then some form. So it seems to define the slots. So these circles that we're seeing over here. But, uh, and there is just uh, quite a lot of repetition because there are many of these circles. But the whole functionality of this game uh, that is that is produced via this CSS file. So all of this code over here. And as we can see, there is no JavaScript required. So I don't know, we, we could play something like, I click on this, your opponent does this and such. Everything works as expected. So yes, this is, sometimes it can be quite complicated. Uh, about this term, what, do, what, does the, what does the cascading refer to? Well, we're going to, back, to come back to this in a future example. Uh, I think maybe in like five minutes. So in, in order to include some particular set of styles that we that we want to, to apply to, to our web page. Well, first we can create some file where we store such structures. In that case, it would be a CSS type of file. So uh, and then in order to include it into the web page, well, you use a link element and the uh, attribute rel for the rel has to be style sheet. Because this link element is not only for CSS, you can do some, some things like defining over here, what is the icon that we can see for this browser tab. In this case, it's just this little blog. Uh, for, but for importing, sorry, for, no, yeah, it's not like important. For, for importing CSS files, then we follow this type of syntax. I'm going to do that for this particular, page. I already have some, some file called styles.css. Uh, however, it's, it's, it's still not doing nothing. So the syntax for CSS is this one. You first define which element do you want to modify. And then in these brackets, well, you define the particular styling that you want for such element. The syntax is the property of that name, sorry, the name of that property, and then two, two dots, and then the value that you want for the property. Simply, these are separated via uh, a semicolon. Uh, and one may think that also it's basically like an object. Uh, and not really, because in an object, uh, it doesn't matter the order of the elements, but for CSS, it does. Okay, I, I didn't have time to finish the example. I was only told that I needed to present like a couple hours ago. So I you know it could be pretty easy to construct one right now, but uh, do, do you want to, to see an, an example or like just uh, finish with the exercises? I, I did finish those. Yeah, I think exercises might be more useful or, or interesting, I guess. I'm, I'm reasonably familiar with CSS. Okay. So let me close a couple tabs. Um, okay. Uh, and this one over here. Just in order to reduce possible lag in my machine. Okay. So let's see the first exercise. Ah, uh, yeah, I didn't mention bootstrap. Uh, but it's going to get it's going to get mentioned in the exercise, so it's okay. So let's see, cutting corners. Uh, what does your browser display if you forget to close a paragraph or a list? So basically, if we copy paste this into the browser, does it still work? They don't have the closing tags. Uh, well, at least for me, they did work, both in both in Chrome and in in H, but I mean, we can check it again. I think there is enough time. 
it's uh, well there is a page and I'm going to visualize it right now. Okay. Um well first it looks fine, but is it really fine? Like is the HTML code and uh, the one that we expected, or is it really just this one that yeah, well it's wrong? Well, maybe we can press control U. I oh, know it's it's doing no. Then let's inspect it. So we click, we right click, press inspect. Uh, and when we see the DOM, that is the, the, the representation of the of this tree structure uh, for the page. Then as we can see over here in the body, for example, for this paragraph. It does have a closing tag, despite the fact that we never defined it over here. So it seems, at least for for this particular example, that even if the key, if the code was Chrome, uh, like at least this navigator, Google Chrome, uh, it managed to fix it by itself. So it looks fine. Uh, it happened the same for me when I uh, did it in Edge. Was that was that the same case for you? Yeah, I, I'm I'm using Chrome, um, but it, I mean, I guess with uh, with Edge, it's probably going to be the same since it's using Chrome under the hood. I I guess. Edge? Uh, no, I think they have a very different. Well, I know the technical term. Uh, let's see what is the the. Uh, a, be, a very different engine for for constructing the web page. And well, I think it, it, it works in Chrome and in Edge. Uh, and in that case, uh, yeah, the behavior was also consistent for this. Yeah, same for me. Okay. Now, next exercise, mix and match. So we create a page that contains a two by two table. And each cell has a three item bullet point list. Um, they want us to reduce the indentation of the item list. No, sorry, of the list items. But we have to do that using CSS. So let's see. Well, I have this solution already. So maybe let's copy paste it uh, and see what is going on. So for this part of the body, it's really just a table. Uh, we can see we have three items for for sale, as you can see over here, and they are just getting repeated. So, if we see into the page, it, if we only create a table that well that they mentioned and um, and provide no CSS, so it looks like this in the beginning. Uh, wait, no, let's, fir let's first add some borders in order to properly recognize the table. Okay, so we can add borders to a specific element. In this case, those are the, the table cells or the table data. We have this property. The thickness of the border, if we want it to be solid or dashed, and then the color of the border. But as we can see, there is a little bit of a space between those borders and we can remove that space using this other uh, uh, declaration. So for the table, we collapse its border and it's basically now like concatenating, uh, no, merging the, the cells of the table. And uh, now for the part of the indentation, well, they mean this space to the left. Um, because we're working over here with an um, order list, as we can see over here. Then I declare some styling for it. Um, at first, one may think, oh, maybe I will just make sure that there is no space to the left of this order list. And that is basically what we're doing over here. And there is a slight uh, technicality, if I really mean all of the space to the left of this order list, I, I should also refer to the margin property. Uh, but for this example, it didn't seem to matter. So I want the space to the left of this order list to, 
well, to not exist, to there not be a space to the left. However, uh, well, this happens. So like the, the bullet points, like and then they seem to have also getting translated to the left, but not how we want it. And in order to avoid this uh, problem with the markers, that is the bullet points, no, sorry, the, the things that set item one, item two, and item three, well, it turns out that you can use this particular uh, declaration. And now it works. Did you do something similar? Actually, I didn't. Um, I didn't have time today for the, the, ex the many of the exercises. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I didn't work on this one. I, I wasn't familiar with that property actually, so that's that's new to me. And yeah, me neither. Uh, I learned it only due to this exercise. Uh, however, this also raises an interesting point about CSS, uh, and that, that is that the learning core for CSS it is not like for a typical language. Uh, not even for a typical programming language because you usually, obviously you scale from basic to more complicated, but you always find a connection, for example, in R, and you always find a connection between the complicated stuff that you're doing and how it relates to the basic things. However, at least in my case, uh, when learning CSS, it's not like, it, there is not that type of connection, like when, when learning a programming language, sometimes it's like, oh, like, oh, you didn't know about this specific property, and now you do. Uh, and that's the difference. Yeah. So, like, sometimes it feels like you have to memorize a bunch of things, but it has to, it's hard to, to connect them, like, in a, a stacking kind of way, that you're growing from basic to more complicated knowledge. Sometimes it just feels like, or oh, I know more properties than you, for example. Something like that. But yeah. still, I, I still uh, CSS is pretty, uh, at least for me, I, I do find it to be the most interesting thing about front end. Uh, let's see. They say, well, now that this page works, does it, it is still working in other, in other browsers? Uh, for me, it did work. Uh, but ho however, they seem to imply that uh, for other browsers, probably Firefox, because I only tried it in Chrome and Edge, uh, it does not work. Um, so why do programs behave inconsistently? Well, that is because there's really not like a, an obligatory syntax that you have to follow or, or yeah, in, in order for for how should the CS code look like. So there is not like a defined global standard for how sh things should be done. There, there are only recommendations in the end. So like Google, sorry, Google Chrome, Firefox, and Edge, they are, con they are contract constructing the web pages in a different manner. Sometimes some of the declarations that we use in CSS they are recognized by some by by uh, some navigator and not by others. Um, well, but that's just part of the job, I guess. Because if, if that were not the case, I mean, that would be pretty monopolic because it would be like, oh, every programming standard for CSS has to follow this specific one. But there's, any, there's not really a valid reason for why that has to be the case. I kind of like it as an aside, Lucia, I, I kind of wonder to what extent that's that's changing. Like I, I sort of have this impression, perhaps a wrong one, that you know CSS is now developing kind of specs for um, future CSS, and it seems like a lot of a lot of people are contributing to them, and um, and the engines, you know, are, are trying to follow the specs if if I if you will but I mean it still may be so so in that sense I I would expect that maybe for new features in CSS that there may be more consistency between the browsers um, but maybe differences might still occur because of the way in which the different browsers uh, like construct construct this page or maybe if they have sort of 
default CSS, right? If the user doesn't provide any CSS, maybe the diff like there's may still maybe like a default style sheet that might be injected by the, the browser somehow. I don't know. Do you know more about this actually? It's a little off topic. Uh, well, I will contribute a little bit. For example, about what you mentioned about the default CSS. Uh, well, that is probably the most easier, not the easiest to recognize difference because for something simple like um, a slider input, uh, in Chrome, by default, they look blue. However, if you open it in Edge, they look gray. So again, there is no reason why they have to be the same color. It's just a, a default. But now about what you mentioned about uh, the most recent uh, added features for CSS, well, I, I, I do think at least from what I saw, for example, for, for the has, uh, let me see, I think the term is pseudo selector. Pseudo selector. No, the pseudo class, sorry. For, for this has pseudo class, I mean, it was something that was requested a very long time ago because yeah. it's very, very powerful. But despite the fact that I think it was only last year or last last year that it was added for for google chrome we saw that very fast it was also added for for the other modern browsers like firefox and edge and it's the same notation so it, it does seem to be the case uh, of what you mentioned that perhaps the terminologies uh, they are converging into something similar now for different browsers Now, for this part about the naming exercise, uh, so they basically are working with this specific example that we well, we didn't cover it, but it's quite simple. They're using Bootstrap, so think of it like a, a library, a uh, full to full of declarations of CSS. So I'm going to copy this, uh, and well, let's take a look at how the same. How does the browser render it? I also here there is an issue and there is a, a problem in the book. This needs to be changed for it to work. But now it does work. So let's see. We define well inside this div of class Jambotron and, and of class text center. We define the, the main title, as you can see over here, and some paragraphs. Now, where Bootstrap is coming in place is that uh, in no part of the code, are we defining what is the Jumbotron class. So that is, what is the uh, style changes that it is producing, in this case, for this particular div. Uh, and what is also, what is the text center class? So what, what declarations is, is it producing? Uh, but this has been imported, as you can see over here, from this file. And if one wants to take a look at it, uh, maybe let's click inspect. Over here, click sources. Um, we can see it over here. Let's see. Bootstrap.min.css. Oh, it's okay. So what we have downloaded is basically all of this. Now, there is a point. Uh, let's see. Uh, yes, um, yes, maybe let's look at, at yours. Uh, it's going to be the same, probably, if they are the same version on all of that. Uh, but we have for here uh, the, the CSS declarations that we are using. So, for example, for Jambotron, let's look it up, Jambotron. And it's over here, as you can see. They are setting some values for the padding, for the margin, for the background color, uh, from, uh, for the border radius. So now it's more like, sorry, now that we're using Bootstrap, it's more like memorizing uh, what is the name of the class that we, want, that we want to use and just call it in order for the declarations to be applied. So that, that is the use for this <coughs> Bootstrap library or, or perhaps more properly called uh, this Bootstrap framework. Okay, but now coming back to the question, uh, what is this 
What is the what is the SM keyboard stand for? And it stands for a small screen. I think over here I have this. Uh, it's a type of breakpoint. <laughs> there is enough time. So even if one constructs its web page, uh, it's usually appropriately to to change how it looks depending on the screen size. So depending, for example, if you're looking at it from your desktop or, for, or from your mobile phone. Uh, and that's the idea of this break of this breakpoint. So what this what they provide, as you can see, in this case for the small breakpoint whose class infix is SM, as we have been using it, for example, over here and over here, is that if the if the width of the of the page is at least a uh, five hundred seventy six pixels, then some specific rules are going to be applied to your web page. But such rules are in such a way so that the user in that specific dimension for the screen, uh, well, he or she can get the best experience of the page. So, like, the content is tidied up in the form that you can read it quite clearly. So sometimes that's, that means that, for example, if this was too, uh, as we can see over here, if this screen is too narrow, well then perhaps it's best to, as has occurred, uh, hide this table of contents and hide this another table of contents. Uh, and that's the main idea. I think it's called this concept, ah, uh, yeah, responsive design. So like adapting the how your how the elements in your page are shown depending on the dimensions on the of, of the of the device that you are using in order to access such page. Uh, maybe over here it's describes a little bit more. And so basically, a media query, right? Yes. The specific part is probably in your code that you sent. Yeah, it is. I had to go searching for it a little bit. It's after the offset block. Um, unfortunately, I don't have it open in a text editor. So, uh, well, I you can see over here. Yep, yep. There's the 567 pixels. Yeah. There is some specific declarations for this type of small device. They are setting a max width, uh, and well, probably we can find more also. So many ch many things are changing for this specific breakpoint of the width for the spleen, as we saw over here. Many different breakpoints. And um, okay, so that's what it's doing. So that's the basic answer to the question over here. Uh, let's see what more do you ask. Ah, so what do they what do this stand for? So this stands for that in the case of a, a small screen, and we saw that is a width of at least 576 pixels. They want for this specific element that is this deep, no sorry, this one, to contain four twelfths of the full width of its parent. In this case, this other specific element, they want its width to be eight twelfths of the full width of its parent. And, and that's what we see. And let's see, let me reduce this a little bit. Okay. Mm, where is it? Over here. This is occupy, it's occupying four twelfths of the width of its parent and this will double the size. So A to S. Uh, well, well, what are options? Well, they're basically in the same, in this same document. And then they mention why do web developers use this type of Fortran style? But I, I don't know. I mean, I know that Fortran is a programming language, but I didn't know what they mean. But I think 
they mean a little bit why are we using this type of character for separating words and such and this type of terminology uh, well it, that is called give up case there are many types to to write if many cases that you shall for example in python something like bar one or oh, there's also camel case or something like camel case separating words via changing to an uppercase. Uh, but le at least this case of using gave up case, uh, well, that is the, the usual for, for front end. I don't know why, but that, that has been the case. So I will I will not question it. Well, I'm, I'm guessing that it's like a convention, but I guess the dots, dots might be, uh, you know, like if you have an object-oriented language, it might be confusing. I don't know. It's a guess. Um, yeah, that's true, because JavaScript is also an object-oriented language. Uh, well, for this color app, I provided this example over here. Let's see. They want us to have a page that displays a word color, and well, start changing the color of such word. Uh, we had a hundred different randomly generated colors. So well, the website looks like this. It's just going to keep going. Uh, but the main idea, well, you can read it also in the code, but perhaps something new that we have used over here is this function random from the math module and also the floor function. Uh, and this one over here. So I have defined some function. So in order to change the color of the text into another one, but I, how often do I want to change this color? Say I wanted to change it every 250, 250 milliseconds. Then you can use this set interval function. So we are changing the color every 250 milliseconds. Perhaps there are a little bit of things in the code that may be new, uh, at least for us in the in the book lab. But in order yeah, in order to finish these exercises, uh, they ask what different units can you use to specify text size in CSS. Well, there are a lot. There are also relative or absolute units. Or here I provided some of the some of the possible values. And then they ask, what do they mean? Uh, well, I know, just read the documentation. And then what does anything mean when you get right down to it? Uh, I don't really know. Do you want to answer that question? Yeah, I actually don't know either. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I put this, when, when, when we got down with it, anything is nothing. There is no universal truth in the universe. Or is such fact the one universal truth for us not to lose touch with reality? <laughs> um, and that's it. And this is a basic overview of CSS. Now for the shiny UI book lab, we are, we are also going to be covering CSS on Tuesday. So if any of the members of this book lab wants to get, to get a deeper dive, well, also basic, but probably, a, a little bit more at least from what we saw in this chapter. And they can, they can also look for the, for the, for the future YouTube video of such a meeting. Uh, I think the book lab is called Shiny UI. I, yep. What's the official name? Uh, yeah, it shows up in Slack as Shiny UI, but I think it's Outstanding User Interfaces for Shiny or something like that. Uh, let me pull up the book. Outstanding user interfaces with Shiny, yeah. Okay, so in the chat I included something that probably if you type this in the in YouTube, you can get a video if you want to learn a little yeah. more about CSS. And then uh, after 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 that, uh, also um, what do you call it? Um, uh, SAS. Uh, so, you're going to yeah. present that, right? Yeah, I'm going to present that. I I I I tinker with it, so I I figure it'd be like an opportunity to actually 
learn it properly. <laughs> yeah, I, I, although they explore more from the the R library called SAS. Called SAS, yeah. From the actual SAS language. I, I did find that a little bit weird, but it makes sense because it's shiny oriented. So yep, yeah, exactly. We have to use uh, well, okay, that's it. Uh, Lucio, thank, Lucio, you, for thank you so much for, for presenting a short notice. It was really a brilliant job. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thanks. We'll see you on Tuesday. Yeah, see you then. Bye. All right. Bye bye.